Okay, guys, I guess we're on the road. Um, again, welcome to Discovery. Question on the table is who wrote the Torah? Was it God, was it man? We're looking for some sort of information in this whole seminar that points to one side or another. Okay, did you guys have the spy scenario this morning, like how to validate a message through, you know, the Mossad, the whole scenario, you had that? Okay, so where this class fits in Discovery is codes. You know, ABC in the spy world, you have to have a code. Question, has anyone here ever heard about codes in the Torah? Yeah, okay, question number two. Is anyone like a little bit skeptical about codes in the Torah? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Before we start then, let me ask a question. And it goes like this. Why would I even think to start to look for codes in an ancient Hebrew text? I mean, it's a little strange if you think about it. So don't open this ancient Hebrew text and let's look for codes. Why would you even start to look for codes in the Torah? Does anyone have an approach to that? Anyone have an answer? Yeah. If you believe that God wrote the Torah and you think that it has knowledge, then of course ah, you're going to try to find Very, it. very good. Okay, if it's true, God wrote the Torah, I'd expect to see a little bit more depth in this book than just a bunch of nice stories and a bunch of laws. But it goes even further. Look, if you guys would give me about five minutes, and I'm not going to do this, but let's say you would, I'd run downstairs, it's a fairly new building, I'd come back here with a big piece of paper, I call it a blueprint. Now I'd stick this blueprint on the table and look at the blueprint and I'd say, window, 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 yeah, window, 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 door over there, yeah, door over there, door over here, door over there. In other words, this entire room is encoded on this piece of paper I call the blueprint. Question, what came first, the room or the blueprint? blueprint? The blueprint. That's why I'd start to look for codes in the Torah. Look, according to the Kabbalistic view, the Jewish mystic view of the Torah, the Torah is possibly something you've never heard before. It says in the Zohar, the Torah Book of Mysticism, God looked into the Torah and created the world. According to the Zohar, the Torah is the blueprint of creation. Now that's why I'd start to look for codes in the Torah, but it goes even further. I want to go on. About 300 years ago, there's a very famous Kabbalist. His name was the Vilna Gon, and he wrote the following. The rule is that all that was, is, and will be until the end of time is included in the Torah, from Bereshit, which is the very first verse of the Torah, to Lene Kol Yisrael, which is the very last verse of the Torah. And not merely in a general sense, but including the details of every species, of each person individually, and the most minute details of everything that happened to him from the day of his birth to the day of his death. What's this claiming? This claiming everything you ever did do, are doing, will do, is encoded in the Torah. And by the way, not only you, but everyone in this room, and by the way, not only everyone in this room, but everyone in this planet, and by the way, not only everyone on this planet, but everyone through all of time. I would like to say that's got to be one of the wildest claims of any book in history. I mean, there's a little bit of room to be skeptical here, but let's go a little further. 500 years ago, one of the great Kabbalists, Svat, wrote the following, Moshe Cordova in a book called Pardes Ramon. The secrets of our holy Torah are revealed through knowledge of combinations, numerology, dealing with numbers which we call gematria, switching letters, first and last letters, shapes of letters, first and last verses, skipping of letters, and letter combinations. In other words, this is a specific way all this information is jammed into the Torah. Now we'll get back to this, I just want to finish. <clears throat> because of their great hiddenness, we don't have the ability to fully comprehend them. Further, to see different angles through these methods is infinite without limit. On this, the Torah says, the measure is longer than the world. Basically what this saying is the following. If I look at every like fifth letter in the Torah, there's a message there. If I look at the fifth letter in the Torah, but go in the other direction, there's another message. If I look at every 167th letter, every 1,597th letter, the shapes, everything there is there to teach me a lesson. We have all these ways of getting it out. Now all we have to do is apply the message and see how it comes out. Everyone with me? Okay, so let's go. In the 1940s, there was a rub in the name of Weissmandel. Rub Weissmandel, he's very famous because of all the kids he saved in the Holocaust, but he ever heard about this stuff and he said, you know what, I'm gonna try it out. So what did he do? He decided to look for something very simple, very, very simple. He decided to look for the code Torah in the Torah. So what did he do? He noticed something very interesting. If you start 
with the very first book of the Torah, Bereshis, the first book, he noticed that what? If you start with the first tough in the book of the Torah, skip 50 letters, you get a vav, skip, the letter, skip 50 letters, you get a resh, skip 50 letters, you get a hey. When it says 50 here, that means between every single letter, there's a 50 letter skip. All of a sudden, what I do, I have a code Torah in the Torah. Question, is this proof there's codes in the Torah? Why not? Yeah, look, does anyone know how many letters long the Torah is? The Torah is 304,805 letters long. Is there any wonder that somewhere in this book, at some sort of skip, I'm going to find the word Torah? What do you guys say? No, I could probably find the same thing in the Jerusalem Post. Look, if I cop, open up a copy of the Jerusalem Post and I look for the first P, skip 50 letters O, 50 letters S, 50 letters T, Post, would I conclude someone is putting codes in the Jerusalem Post? What do you guys say? No. Oh. All right, so he went on. He found something else very, very interesting. He noticed that in the second book of the Torah, he found four words in a row, and these four words spell out Rambam. Rabot Maftai Be'eretz Mitzrayim. Four letters of each, each first letter of each of the words, four in a row, you have the code Rambam. The Rambam, by the way, was one of those greatest sages in history. Um, question, is any question, or is any surprise that I'm going to find four words in a row that spell out the word Rambam, the first letters? What do you guys say? By the way, the Torah is about 80,000 words. Does it surprise you guys? No, however, I don't know if Rev. Weissmel knew this, but by the way, they later did a computer search of the Torah, and they found that the only place in the Torah where you find a phenomenon like this is right here. So we can ask ourselves, well, look, if it's only right here, maybe the background information has something to do with this little code we sort of just found here. Does anyone know where did Ram, what's that? Did he live in Israel? Yeah, where did Ramban spend most of his life? In Egypt. So here we have the Ramban found in an area where it's talking about Egypt. Now another thing too, he looked a little further and what did he find? This is talking about the very first Pesach sacrifice in human history and it says on Arba Eser Yom Lechodesh Hazeh on the 14th day of that month, it's talking about taking a Pesach offering. Does any of you know in Hebrew when does Pesach come out on? What month? In spring, what month? Anyone know the month? Nisan. That happens to be the Ramam's birthday. So what do we have? We have the Rambam. The whole background is Egypt, and we have his birthday. Then Rev. Weissmetal decided, you know what? I'm going to look for the Rambam's most famous book, possibly the most famous book in Jewish history. It's a book called the Mishnah Torah, which basically goes into detail of the 613 mitzvahs. So he decided to look for the word Mishnah, and what did he find? He found overlaying the Rambam's name, we found the word Mishnah, again, at a 50-letter skip. So we have over here, Mishnah. And then down here, he found the word Torah, again at a 50 letter skip. So what do we have? We have the Rambam. We have his most famous book. And again, we have his birthday. And the whole background is where he spent most of his life. However, there's something that bothered him about this. Anyone know what bothered him about it? Look, the book is not called Mishnah. Torah. The book's called Mishnah Torah. What's the distance between Mishnah and between Torah? So he got a little curious, and he counted the letters between Mishnah and Torah. Anyone want to guess how many letters there are between those two words? There are 613 letters, which, by the way, is the subject of the book. Anyways, you guys got to realize that Reb Weissmantel, he would, yeah? How come you didn't just name, how do we not know that he named himself Rambam after reading it? After reading it. <laughs> 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 OK. That's a, that's, that's a, no way. Okay, no, wait, wait. So you're talking about that whenever they wrote the Torah, they said, you know what, we're going to put four words in a row and it's going to be Rambam, and we're going to put it in there, Mishnah Torah, because maybe this guy someday is going to write the book Mishnah Torah, and we're going to separate it by 613 letters, because maybe that's going to be the title of the book, or the subject of the book. <laughs> okay, let, let's hold on. We'll hold on. We'll, we'll go on. We'll go on with this. Okay. I hear. Okay. No problem at all. No problem at all. Okay. Now, one thing you have to realize, though, Rev. Weissmantel, he wasn't a statistician. He wasn't a mathematician. He was a rabbi at yeshiva in Europe. What happened was he wrote a book called 
uh, Taurus Tamid. I happen to have a copy of it on my shelf at home. Anyways, this book went around the yeshivas, and what happened was in the 1970s, two mathematicians from Hebrew University got a hold of this book, and they looked at all the stuff he found, and they said, this is unbelievable. There seems to be codes in the Torah. They got really, really excited, but you know what? Before I go a little bit further, let me introduce you to one of the professors, Professor Eliyahu Rips. Let's see if we can get him. Hopefully we can get him. Ah. to a Soviet psychiatric hospital, a common punishment for political protesters. There, with time on his hands, he worked on a mathematical problem that was to amaze the academic world. When Rips was in prison, he had the idea to work on a famous unsolved problem called the dimension subgroup conjecture. This had been a problem which Westerners thought they had solved. In fact, there was a published paper in one of the best journals by very esteemed famous people claiming to have solved this conjecture and given a proof of it. When he was in detention, he had no paper to work with, so one of the guards actually got him some pencil and a little piece of toilet paper. Using only this, he was able to refute the greatest minds in the West. He showed this conjecture was actually false, even though all the experts thought they had proven it was true. Let's turn the subject on its head. After two years, Rips was released and allowed to emigrate. He arrived in Israel with a reputation as a man of unshakable integrity and as a brilliant theoretical mathematician. Lips is an extraordinary mathematician. I mean, not just an outstanding mathematician. There are many outstanding mathematicians, but he's a world star. I mean, Oxford and Cambridge would be delighted to have Lips as a professor. It was now in Israel that Rips was introduced to the world of the Bible codes. One well-known Google code found in the Bible is called a skip code. Skip codes involve a different way to read a text than we normally do. Usually we read one letter at a time, the first letter, the second letter, and the third letter, and so forth. But with a skip code, we might start with the third letter, and then skip ahead 10 to the 13th letter, and then to the 23rd letter, and so forth. And maybe that would spell out a new word, jumping 10 letters at a time. Here's an example. There's a sentence here that says, my way of showing a skip code is encrypted in the very words I put down here. Let's take the first letter and jump every 14 and make that red. It's very hard to read as it's written here. We see the letter M, A, R, Y, H, A, D. It's not so legible. So to make it look nicer and understand it better, what we usually do is we break the line before each red letter. So now, we have each line starting with a red letter. And now those red letters are in a column and it's very easy to read. Mary had a little lamb. One of these simple codes particularly called Ripsy's imagination. It appears at the beginning of the Torah, the Jewish Bible, which is made up of the first five books of the Old Testament. When we start with the first 
stay in the book of Genesis. In fact, it comes in the first verse. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Starting with the first T and taking every 50 letters, the word Torah appears. Exactly the same pattern appeared in the second book of the Torah, Exodus. Again, starting with the first T and skipping 49 letters. The word Torah appears. It was enough to me to be most intrigued and to think something very interesting might uh, go on. Ritz began to employ a computer program that could search for skip codes like this at enormous speed. He could have had no idea where it would lead. Okay, guys, back to it. So again, like I say, Professor Ripps and his colleagues, they read this book and they found this information. They got really excited that there must be codes in the Torah, but they were both religious. They didn't want to take it too fast, so they said, you know what? We're going to check this out with one of our colleagues, Professor Daniel Michelson, who's a Russian-born Russian -born mathematician. The guy was an atheist, a real skeptic. So they went Professor Michelson, and they gave him the book, and he looked through it. He sat down for three days with the calculator. Three days later, he said, I am convinced there are toads, codes in the Torah. The, and the possibilities of this being by accident, by chance, too, too slim. So the professors got excited and said, ah, you got to admit that God put codes in the Torah. Professor Michelson said, that's not exactly what I had in mind. What do you think he thought? Sure, there were codes in the Torah. Who put the codes in? Yeah, people. He said, you know, the Jews who were running around the desert for 40 years, they had a lot of time on their hands. They could have taken sentences to them one way, another way, this way, that way. They could turn the Torah into a giant crossword puzzle. He said, no, look, if we want to call this scientific, look, what is the very first rule we would have broken if what I just showed you before, if we're trying to call it a scientific experiment? In other words, if you're doing an experiment, what's the very first thing you have to have? Anyone in science here? Yeah, hypothesis. You have to sort of listen to it like this. You have to talk about what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, what you expect to see, do the experiment, see what happens. Here, Rev. Weissman was just looking around for nice things. He found very interesting stuff, but it wasn't scientific. He said, no, let's step this up a little bit. So what do they do? They went to a standard book of Jewish law called the Mishnah Berurah, and in a section on Hanukkah, they took out all the key words, and with this pre-selected word list, they said, okay, let's go in the Torah and let's see what we find. So what do they do? First of all, you have to realize back in those days, computers were very, very slow, like this. <laughs> Not so fast today, are they? Ah, here we go, okay. They were very, very slow. They decided just to look in the first book of the Torah, the book of Genesis, which is fair because we also have a tradition that all the Torah is actually jammed in the that book too. So they said, computer, find me the word Hanukkah, the very first word on the list. The computer looked for every one letter, every two letters, every three letters, every four letters. Finally, the computer said, got it. I found the word Hanukkah in the book of the Torah. Where? Basically? Basically? Sorry, guys. Right here. OK, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that little box and I'm going to blow it up so we can see what we're looking at. But just keep in mind, when I blow it up, if we were to take the Torah and blow it up, we're looking at a giant movie screen, meaning I have to knock out that wall, knock out that wall, knock out the ceiling, knock out the floor, a giant screen, and right on the screen, right here, what? We find the word Hanukkah. There we go. OK, in other words, the computer found it at a 262-letter skip right here in the first book of the Torah, a Hanukkah. Now, question, is it surprising that somewhere in the Torah, at some sort of letter skip, I'm going to find the word Hanukkah? What do you guys say? No, I could probably find the Jerusalem Post, you know, Moby Dick, whatever. What gets interesting is, now that we have the word, and now that we have the grid set up, when I start to look for the other words. You guys with me? OK, so the next word they looked for was Hashmanoi. Who are the Hashmanoim? Anyone know? Who are these people? The people that fought. They were the ones, the family that fought against the Greeks during the Battle of Hanukkah. Now they found it at a 525 letter skip. Again, when you have a minus, that means it goes backward right next to Hanukkah. Now again, we're looking at a giant movie screen. Yeah? Does it make a difference that Hanukkah is 
Uh, no, it can go either way, upside down, forwards. That's, that's fair. That's, you know, we have traditions that go any directions, any directions at all. OK, now, but we'll keep in mind, we're looking at this giant movie screen, giant movie screen, and we have Hanukkah right next to Hashmanoi. Now, again, it's, chances are it'd be like me going up on a windy day over Jerusalem in a helicopter. I take a paper airplane, I throw it out, and it goes a couple turns around, say, Mount Scopus. It goes around Mount of Olives. It comes back over here and lands on the roof of Asia Torah. And then I go in another airplane. I face the other direction, another paper airplane. It goes down to, let's say, Yad Vashem, straight down to that new spring, stream bridge, right up Jaffa Road, and lands on the roof of Asia Torah. A little bit strange. Why in a screen so big in a city so big? Anyways, we have two words. Let's look for another one. They found the word Maccabee. Who are the Maccabees? Anybody? The, yeah, there's the names of the guys that were fighting against the Greeks. It's not the name of the beer, right? Now, in this case, what's really interesting is it crosses right over Hanukkah. So again, we have three paper airplanes. And in two cases, the nose of one lands on the wing of another. Let's look for another word. They found the word Yehuda. Anyone know who Yehuda was? He was yeah, he was a brilliant tactician, amazing guerrilla fighter. He was head of the brothers, head of the Maccabees. They also found the word, whoop, they also found the word. Ah, here we go. Okay, Yvan. Yvan were the Greeks. And again, that's who we were fighting for. And again, this time it lands right on top of the word Hashemnoyim, the protagonist, one fighting the other. Again, in two cases, we have these planes flying all over Jerusalem, and they land on the roof of Asia Torah, and the nose of one lands on the wing of another in two cases. And finally, they found Chet Yamim, eight days, which was the miracle of Hanukkah. I'll find you something else you found. Very, very interesting. Let's move. OK, so they looked, and they found the word. Does anyone know how to say diabetes in Hebrew? Sukkaret, Sukkaret from the word Sukkur. So they said computer, find the word Sukkaret, it found it right here, minus letter skip, six letter skip, going backwards, Sukkaret. Does anyone know if someone has diabetes, what's the organ that it affects? Asfashallah, anybody? Pancreas. pancreas, does anyone know how to say pancreas in Hebrew? Lav Lav. So they said computer, find me, Lav Lav. And they found it a little bit up here, Lav Levan. Lav Lut minus one. If somebody has diabetes, what's the drug they use in order to? Insulin. insulin. They said, computer, finally the word insulin. The computer looked and looked and looked and looked and then said, got it. Where? Right over here. From Sukkarit going up towards Lavlu. It ate 3,378 letter skip right over here. Now, at this point, yeah. Sorry, I two quick questions. One, Please. Um, did they find these words anywhere else in the Torah? What's that? Now, these are all shorter skips. I believe insulin is completely unique, actually. Completely unique. Yeah, yeah. And the others, they? The others, it could be at a greater skip. It could be at, you know, at a very, very big skip. This is the smallest skips that they found, as far as I know. Okay. We're going to get into your question, though. You're asking a very good question. We're going to get that in a minute, just a moment. And then OK? Yeah? Other really quick. Um, these words are in modern Hebrew. That doesn't? So there are standard ways of looking. They just, you know, all these words, they took them straight out of a standard Jewish text. I know we have certain rules for spelling things. Uh, you know, these words are actually, yeah, there's, there's, let's put it this way, there's rules for spelling words in even in modern Hebrew. You know, they take the word standard spelling, Spanish spelling, nothing different, okay? Okay, so anyways, at this point, you guys gotta realize, Daniel Michelson, remember, Russian-born mathematician, he was completely blown away. He says, this is unbelievable. We gotta get this published. So what do they do? They decided to go to the Journal of Statistical Science, which was, I think still is, one of the best magazines around in the world of statistics to get this published. They went to the magazine, showed them all the, all the, all the material, and the magazine said, cute, you guys are cheating. Cheating, cheating, and cheating. There's actually a very easy way to cheat in something like this. Anyone want to guess how? Very simple. Very, very simple. What's that? Simpler than that. No, no, simpler than that. Look, you look for like one million diseases, one million diseases, and the one that works out, you know, uh, sukkarit, you know, di insulin, diabetes, lavlu. Say, look at this, unbelievable, but the 999,999 that did not work out, you throw them in the garbage, throw them in the pot. Don't tell anyone. Something's going to work out somewhere. Just simple. Everyone follow what I'm saying? So the professor said, look, 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 just to prove the point, why don't we do an experiment together? In other words, they said, you know, we predict we're going to find the names of famous rabbis in the Torah. How do you guys want us to look for them? So the magazine said, OK, tell you what you do. 
Look for a whole list of rabbis, not just one, a whole list, and look for some sort of point, important information in connection to the name right next to it. So they said, okay. We predict we're going to find the name of these famous rabbis, and next to it, we'll find the dates of their death, which in Hebrew we call their Yotzai dates. The magazine said, go for it. So what they do, they went to a standard Hebrew encyclopedia, and they decided any rabbi that had four or more columns of information, they're called a famous rabbi, and they came up with a list of, here we go, they came up with a list of 34 rabbis. Now, a formula was decided on, they ran the experiment, and you guys got to realize the results were absolutely astounding. I'll give you an example. One of the rabbis, for instance, his name was? <coughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, his name was the Harmarshal. Now, again, we found it at 220 letter skip. Is it surprising that somewhere in the Torah I'm going to find Harmarshal in the Torah? No. But now when they have it set up, they have the letter and they look for his date of his death. And what have they found? They found right next to it, Yud Beis Kislev. That was the day of his death, the Yord said. Now, by the way, they also found, just out of curiosity, they found his first name, Shlomo. They also found the year of his death, but that's icing on the cake. Now, what they do in an experiment like this is you have to see what the distance is between his name and his Yord site. And they found, again, this is very, very simple, the Pythagorean theory. They found that the two words are 7.21 letters apart. That is unbelievably blow away. Now, by the way, not all the rabbis came out this close. Some came out 20, 30, 60. Some didn't even come out close at all. But by and large, it was so incredible, the magazine said, OK, we'll publish it. Two weeks later, the professors get a letter from the magazine. The magazine said, sorry, we're not publishing the article. The professors asked, well, why not? And they said, because the results are too controversial for the public. At this point, the professors went, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, if there's something wrong with the math, something wrong with the, you know, whatever, that's fine. But this is science. You can't not publish it because you don't like the results. And as that magazine said, wait a minute. If somebody finds a crack, a flaw in this article, we will be the laughing stock in the scientific world. We publish an article that God put goes in the Torah. We can't do it alone. They said, OK, tell you what. If you can get the number one statistician in the world to give approval to this article, we'll publish. So the professor said, great, who's the guy? They said, Professor Percy Diaconis, who I believe still is the head of the Department of Statistics at Stanford University. So what did they do? They made an appointment with Professor Diaconis. And before they went, they actually did their homework, did a little bit of research. They wanted to know who they were meeting. They found out three things, very, very interesting. Number one, he is by and large, by almost everyone, considered, yes, to be the number one statistician in the world. Number two, he has written thousands and thousands of publications on science and statistics. The guy is world famous. He's like published everywhere. But number three, he's a founding member and a contributing editor to the American Skeptics Association. <laughs> you say you have like ESP, yeah? ESP, Percy Diaconis, will prove you wrong. You see, it's all flying saucer. You know, Percy Diaconis will prove you wrong, and he's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he went to see Professor Diaconis, and he looked at the experiments, and he said, cute. Look, I'm sure there's a simple way to explain this. Look, all you guys got to do is the following. I want you to go back to Jerusalem and just do me one thing. I want you to take, uh, let's say, a standard-sized text. Let's take something like, yeah, War and Peace. I want you guys to cut it down the size, same size as the Bible, run the experiment the exact same way. Let's see how it comes out. In other words, computer doesn't have any agenda. If it finds codes in the Bible, it's going to find them anywhere. OK, so they went back to Jerusalem. They took war and peace. They cut it down the size, ran the experiment. They found nothing of any statistical significance. So they called a Professor Diaconis, and they said, well, what now? And he said, uh, let's try Moby Dick. So they took out the Moby Dick, they cut it down to size, ran the experiment, nothing. And then they asked Professor Diaconis, OK, now what? So he said, you know what? Maybe it's something about translated novels. Like, take a couple original Hebrew texts. Let's run the experiment. Let's see what happens. They did it. They took a couple Hebrew novels, cut it down to size, same size as the Bible, ran the experiment, nothing. And then Professor Diaconis said, well, look, maybe it's something about modern Hebrew versus ancient Hebrew. Let's run a couple ancient Hebrew novels through, or texts, excuse me, ancient Hebrew texts. Let's see what happens. So what do they do? They cut a couple ancient Hebrew texts. They cut it down to size, ran the experiment, nothing. Then he had a couple other ideas and ran more experiments. And he said, I got another idea. And then they said, Professor Diaconis, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
with all due respect, I mean, this could go on forever. Would you please tell me now, in writing, before we go any further, how many experiments will it take before you give a letter of approval for publication? So Professor Donacona said, OK, if you guys can run one million experiments and find nothing of any statistical significance, I'll give a letter of approval. One million. The professors went back to Jerusalem. And from 1990 to 1994, right into the middle of it, three and a half years, they had a computer running 24 hours a day running one permutation after another, after another, running through experiment after experiment after experiment. They're just waiting to see what was going on. They had no idea what was going to happen. Three and a half years later, the computer stopped. They took all the data, looked it over, one million experiments. They found nothing of any statistical significance, nothing. They went back to Professor Diconis. He was shocked. They <laughs> never expected to see them again, yeah? He looked through the information. He sent some samples out to his friends to make sure nobody was cheating. Everything looked good. And he gave a letter of approval saying, yes, I authorized publication of this article. With this letter, they went back to the magazine. The magazine also was shocked. They didn't expect to see him again. They said, OK, we'll publish. But there's one more thing we want. One more thing we want. We want to know what is the statistical confidence level of this experiment. Let me explain. If you're doing a scientific experiment, you're going for publication, you have to show there is a 1 in 20 chance you just got lucky. That's considered strong, worthy of publication. There's different ways to do it, Monte Carlo method, this and that, whatever. If you're doing something a little heavier, something like life and death experiments, medical experiments, you have to show 1 in 50 you just got lucky. So what did the magazine ask for the professors? They didn't want 1 in 20, not 1 in 50. What did they ask for? They want one in 1,000, a one in 1,000 chance you just got lucky. I guarantee you will find no scientist anywhere in the world that's ever gotten to get, had to get odds of one in 1,000 to get published. Why do they make bars so high? Because again, the uh, significance is a little bit significant. <laughs> so they gave the magazine the disk. They gave them all the information. The experiment was run. When it was run, it didn't come out to be one in 20. Not one in 50, not even one in 1,000. When they ran the statistical confidence level of the experiment, again, what chance you just got lucky, what did the results come out to be? They came out to be one in 62,500. There is a one in 62,500 chance you just got lucky. This was enough to get the, magazine, the article published. And what happened? was in 1994, Statistical Science, again, the best magazine around in statistics, published an article, Equidistant Letter Sequences in the Book of Genesis. And you guys got to know, when this thing came out, it made a bomb in the scientific world. Any university, anywhere in the world that had a Department of Statistics, they wanted copies of the experiment. The FBI wanted copies of the experiment. The CIA wanted copies of the experiment. Everyone was totally blown away. And what you'd have, actually, is next three years, you'd have some of the best minds in the world in science, mathematics, getting together to try to find some way to find a crack in this experiment. What happened was, three years later, they came back to the professors and said, ah, we found it. We have found five fatal errors in your experiment. Excuse me, they said, two of the ways you spelled the rabbi's names, they're not spelled like that. And two of the dates they said they died on, they didn't die on those days. What they actually did is paid some guy to fly all over the cemeteries of Europe and take pictures of the tombstones. This is how serious it got. And one of the formulas, there's a problem in one of the formulas. We are publishing an article in the same magazine saying we found five fatal flaws in your experiment. If you look between the lines, they're basically saying you guys like, manipulated the data to make it come out so good, you cheated. The professors were a little bit um, taken aback. They said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. Look, you guys got the tombstones. We have the encyclopedia. We're not going to argue against the tombstones. And the, the, the formula was just an innocent mistake. Look, if you guys want to be fair, there's only one thing to do. One thing. Why don't we just rerun the experiment? Let's change the names the way you want them spelled. Let's chitch up the dates the way you want them dated. Let's sort of fix up the formula. Let's run it again and see what happens. And the magazine, and they, they said, OK, fair enough. So what do they do? They touched up the names, they changed the dates, they corrected the formula, and they ran the experiment again. 
Now, it came out to be a little embarrassing. Just give me time and I'll try to explain. Don't jump on me. It didn't come out when they ran it again with corrected names, corrected dates, corrected formula. It didn't come out to be 1 in 20, not 1 in 50, not 1 in 1,000, not even 1 in 62,500. What did it come out to be? With the corrections it came out to be? 1 in 1,694,000. When I say it was embarrassing, I didn't say to who. <laughs> and what happened is they improved the data, they improved the formula, and it just like shot through the roof. It was unbelievable. Now, just to make it short, what happened was, first of all, some of the critics sort of changed camps. I know one of them became a full-time code researcher, but then you'd have others that went on such a frenzy trying to find some way to find a crack in this experiment. A few years later, they actually published an article in the same magazine trying to show how the data was manipulated in order to make things come out so great. At this point, the professors went to the magazine and said, OK, there's a rebuttal. So you gave us permission to talk back. In other words, they were given permission by the editor that if someone would rebuttal them, they could talk back. The magazine basically said, sorry, um, we have a new editor. And the new editor is not bound by the previous editor's decision. They were locked out. Locked out. So what did they do? They did two things. Number one, they did a new series of experiments that completely avoided all the problems of the original experiment. I'll give an example. Um, here, 63 tactics of the Talmud. You can go to any yeshiva anywhere in the world, you will see the copies of the Talmud on the shelves. There's only one way to spell these names. By the way, the rabbis experiment, they're basically attacked saying there are different ways to spell all rabbis, look for their names and the dates, which is true. That's just what they start out with. So they completely avoided all the problems. They found the 63 tractates of the Talmud encoded in the Torah in a way there is a one in 4,540,000 chance you just got lucky. A professor Harold Gans, or Dr. Harold Gans, very interesting person. He actually was a cryptologist for the US Department of Defense his entire life. He worked with codes. He originally was a tremendous skeptic. He looked into it and he sort of changed his mind and then he started looking for his own codes. He found those rabbis with the cities they live in. In a way, there is a one in one million four hundred eight thousand chance you just got lucky. 70 nations, uh, you know, Noah came out of the ark and they formed 70 nations It formed the rest of the, it went on to form uh, the rest of the countries of the world. They found that those nations encoded in the Torah in a way there is a one in two million, 50, excuse me, 250 million chance he just got lucky. And then what they did is they took these papers, they went to a international conference of pattern recognition in Hong Kong in the year 2006. They presented papers to them, six papers if I remember right, one, two, three, four, five, and six. They were peer reviewed, they were published in their journal. These have been out for years now, years, years, and years, and no one's found any way to touch any of these experiments, not at all. By the way, if you do a Google search on codes, you will find lots and lots of articles uh, sort of trashing the codes, you know, showing how they're wrong. It's interesting to note that most of those are on that original rabbit's experiment or possibly on experiments, even the professors don't even claim are experiments. Again, these have been out for years now and nobody has found any way to find any faults in these articles, in these experiments. Everyone with me? Okay, now with that basis, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to show you some of the stuff that they found over the years. Now, by the way, there's new stuff coming in all the time. There's thousands of people doing this. I'll just show you a little bit of a taste. Now, anything I'm showing here, the odds of chance are less than one in a thousand. Now, the reason I'm giving you such a high bar is because that's what the magazine said. So off we go. Let's do a couple of codes. First, we're going to go to the Holocaust. Now, they found, <coughs> okay, so over here we have at Zerar, the enemy, at a nine-letter skip, just over here, moving on. They found the word right under the enemy, Nazi, at a, at a minus 12 skip. Now, again, this is not the sm smallest skip of Nazi in the Torah. You'll see smaller skips, but significantly, it's highly, highly significant. They found the word Germany. German, that's the way it's spelled in the Talmud. So we have the enemy, the Nazi enemy, Germany, at a 155 skip. Found the word Berlin. Berlin is the capital of capital of Germany. They found the word Shavir Yehudi Jewish catastrophe. That's actually a phrase used one time in all of Tanakh. They found it right here, cutting through everything. So we have the Nazi enemy, Berlin, Germany, Jewish catastrophe. Let's move on. Another quote in the Holocaust. Now holding on to Berlin. 
just looking at it a little bit of a different way. They also found the word Nazi. Now here's a very small skip, the smallest in the Bible. Uh, going backwards, skip over there, Nazi. They found the word Hitler. Everyone knows who Hitler was, Yamak Shemo. So Berlin, Nazi, Hitler, what else did they find? They found the word Russia, right above his name, which is evil. Evil Hitler, the Nazi. They found the word Iro, his city. So Hitler, the evil Nazi from Berlin, of course, was his city. Another code in the Holocaust. Moving on. Now again, holding on to Berlin, they found the word Nazi. Again, at a six-letter skip, a little bigger, but again, statistically significant. They found a Moloch, a giant skip of 7,450 letters. Who is a Moloch? Anyone know? Yeah, well, if I could say such thing, it's like the Lex Luthor of the Jewish people. You know, let's put it that way. So they found right here by Nazi, a Moloch, Berlin. Uh, again, the Nazis were considered to be a Moloch. They found the word Slav Karat, going right over a Moloch, Slav Karat. Giant skips crossing over each other, smallest skips. Another quote on the Holocaust. Here we go. Okay. Okay, so B. Auschwitz, at a 300 letter skip. Moving on, they found the word right overwards, Eichmann. Who was Eichmann? Adolf Eichmann? Yeah, he made his name for himself uh, when, when, when Germany annexed Austria. This is before the war started. They gave him the job. All of a sudden, they had 180,000 new Jews on their hands. They put him in there to say, do something with these guys. He came up with a policy that was so successful, I think he threw out like 100. 35,000 Jews out of Austria. Before the war started, they said, unbelievable. This guy knows what he's doing. He became in charge of the final solution for us of the war. So we found Eichmann over Auschwitz. And of course, Auschwitz was the principal extermination camp of European Jewry. They found the word, it's who, murdered. They found the word, Kalu, destroy. <coughs> they found the word, Kalu, destroyer, finally. Biad SS, at the hands of the SS. And of course, those were the guys that were in charge of the actual destruction. Now moving on a little bit. Uh, hold. So here again we have Eichmann. And by the way, his greatest feat was at the end of the war, he actually sent 450,000 Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz in about eight weeks. It was a masterpiece. And again, how did, what did they use to murder the Jews? They used gas. So they said, computer, find gas. They found it way, way up there. And at one skip, gas, Eichmann gas. Does anyone know what was the name of the gas they used in Auschwitz? Zyklon B. Zyklon B. said, computer, finally, Zyklon B. And where did it find it? Going from Eichmann straight up past gas. <laughs> Moving on. A little change now. Twin Towers. Now, by the way, this is a great example, a great example of why you can't use the codes as a crystal ball. Now, again, everything is in there, but you can't use the codes as a crystal ball. Like if I was sitting around early 2000, the early 2000, sitting around having a cup of coffee, would I say, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to look of codes of Arabian people flying airplanes in the skyscrapers today. I mean, who even thought of such a thing? But once it happens, you take the keywords out, you plug it in, and you see what happens. So what did they find? They found the word. Hatumim, twin, minus one skip going backwards. They find the word Migdalot, twin towers. They found the word Kuf Gimel Elul, which, by the way, happened to be September 11th during that year, going right through twin towers. They found the word Yishmael. Who's Yishmael? He's the founding father of the Arabic people. So they found Yishmael, they found the date, they found twin towers. They also found Vach murdered. And by the way, oh, having said that, before we get into this, does anyone know approximately how many people do they theorize died during the Twin Towers? 3, yeah, about, they say about 3,000. This section here, where it appears in the Torah, it's actually talking about the golden calf, you know, the section of the golden calf, <laughs> and the Levies rose up, and they, all the perpetrators of the golden calf were basically um, put down. And it says here, right in this section, 
ויפל מן העם ביום ההוא, and fell from the nation that day, כשלושת אלף איש, about 3,000 people. Moving on. Another one on the Twin Towers. They found the word matos, airplane, a minus 39 skip. They found the word appeal, knocked down, airplane knocked down, crossing over each other. Find the word hatumim, twin, a 71 skip. They found the word Migdale, towers, twin towers, airplane knocked down. Now it's interesting to note, when they looked for these words, they didn't look for matos hipil, airplane knocked down. Because again, there are two towers, two airplanes. They looked for matos hipilu, plural, airplanes knocked them down. But then someone noticed something very interesting. They found the word pamayim, twice. Moving on. The Mucham, to die there. Another code. Gilad Shalit. Um, unfortunately, this is a little painful. It's a little raw with what just happened to the boys just uh, recently. Gilad Shalit. Does everyone remember him? I hope he, he was actually captured by Hamas. He was held, I believe, for like five years. Five years the boy was held. So they looked for codes on him. He was eventually released, by the way, after five years in captivity. I think they traded him for 1,073 terrorists, something like that, very close to that. They found the word Gilad at a, minor, at a one skip. They found the word Shalit, Gilad Shalit, four skip. They find the word Veshevi, uh, kidnapped. They found the word Hamas, right above. Now, by the way, one thing I have to tell you is we didn't know this at the time. When Gilad Shalit was kidnapped, Hamas was actually bouncing him from one group to another to another, like looking for the highest bidder for this boy. And the interesting thing to note, the section here uh, in the Torah where this part is written is talking about when the, the brothers, the, the sons of um, Yaakov, they sort of took Yosef, one of the brothers, and they sold him. And basically, he was being bounced around from one group to another to another to another. And that happened right here. That's here. V'omer ha'yelet enenu. This is Reuven coming back, trying to save uh, Yosef. And he says, the boy, where is he? He couldn't find it. He looked around. He couldn't find him. That's basically the storyline with Gilad Shalit. He was being bounced around, bounced around. They couldn't find him. They didn't know where he was. Another code. Tsunami. Now, this is another great reason, in my mind, why you can't use Torah as a crystal ball. Again, everything is there. Blueprint of creation, it's all there, but you can't use it as a crystal ball. I don't think I ever heard the word tsunami until I finally heard the word tsunami. So how would I ever look for the word tsunami if I didn't even know what it existed? But once it was there, you take the keywords out of the newspaper, and you look for it. So first of all, they found Yudalit Tevit, the 26th of December. This is when the, not the recent one that wiped out the reactors in Japan. This is the one before that, that hit sort of the rim, Sri Lanka, the Asian basin. They found the word Be'esya, in Asia, crossing right over the date. They found the word Revivat, tens of thousands of people died. They found Tsu drowned Be'tsunami, in a tsunami. Again, I don't think I ever heard the word before the original one hit. So how would I look for it? How would I predict it? Once you hear it, take the keywords out of the newspaper, plug them in, see what you find. I want to show you one more code, and then we'll stop. Any questions you guys have, we'll go for it. Um, Hurricane Katrina. Everyone knows Hurricane Katrina. It was the most powerful hurricane ever to hit. It was, excuse me, it was the largest hurricane ever to hit America. I think the third most powerful was that 80% of New Orleans was like underwater in some places like 20 feet, I think. 15 million people were affected. So again, once it happens, take the keywords out, and you look and you see what you find. They found the word New Orleans. They found the word Kuf Beis Av, which was the Hebrew date when it hit uh, New Orleans. They found the word Hamat Af, Wrath of Anger. And finally, they found Katrina. Again, guys, you know, we could ask, 
if you can't use the Torah as a crystal ball, and you can't, because how do you know what to look for? You know, once you see something that have, what disaster is going to happen? What tremendous event's going to happen? How do you know what to look for? But once it happens, take the keywords out, put it in the computer, see what you find. But we can ask the question then, if that's the case, if you can't use the Torah as a crystal ball, then what's the point? What's the point? So I think the point's the following. Again, aside from being the fact that we'd say the Torah is a blueprint of creation, everything is there, I think there's one more point, and it goes like this. If you're living in a world of scientific methodology, if you're living in a world of skepticism, maybe, maybe someone wanted to give us clear proof we're dealing with a book that could not be produced by human beings. Again, chance? Forget it. Design? Absolutely. Human design? No way. If that's the case, who wrote the book? Thank you very much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the day.